Hello. Stephanie? Yeah, yeah. Dick. Hi, it's Dick, yeah. Hi, how are you? Good. Good, I think I just need to turn on my camera. Okay. Perfect, hi, how are you? <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you so much for uh, speaking to me today. Yeah, happy to. Yeah. So uh, much. Pardon me? I'm excited about what you're trying to do. Oh, great. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I guess I'll just start by kind of explaining the film so far. Does that sound good? Or um, So essentially, we um, I came up with this idea after being in therapy myself. Um, my therapist works with some IFS uh, modalities, and we did um, an exercise about um, visualizing a table of, you know, all the selves that were welcome to come to the table. And then through that exercise, I realized that one self wasn't able to come to the table and that she sort of had to be on her own at a different area and wasn't allowed to be included. And um, I think that was the first time that my therapist actually introduced to me your concept, um, which essentially blew me away. <laughs> and uh, I... Um, I haven't really been able to let go of that. I think this conversation actually happened a few years ago. And then from there, I just kind of thought of the idea of wouldn't it be interesting if that self, which I sort of deemed as an exile, would, um, what would it be like if I made a film about that and, um, and how the, the main self, actually it's interesting So I come to think of her as a self and a manager, the main character, how she deals with the exile coming to visit her and coming to stay with her um, and she doesn't want to address her or deal with her um, and how they can kind of find a sense of togetherness and a sense of integration so yeah so the main two characters are the managers the manager part and the exile part kind of on different ends of the spectrum one's very rigid trying to deny that anything ever happened and the other one is sort of young and and reckless and Throughout the, throughout the course of the film, they have to kind of come together and try to find reconciliation. Um, yeah, so I kind of wanted to talk to you. Um, I just thought it'd be really interesting to talk about some of the themes of the film in terms of like how they come across from an, an IFS standpoint. So um, I came up with a couple questions for you about specific things in, in the film, and I was wondering if I could just kind of ask you some questions to sort of educate people that are going to watch this about the theory and and all that kind of stuff? Certainly. Okay, so um, one thing I was really curious about, I mean, first of all, um, I don't know if it's possible to just give like a, a very succinct description of, of the therapy for people that have never heard about it before. Well, I've, I've never really nailed an elevator speech about it, but <laughs> I I'll struggle give it a with, shot. Yeah. Okay. I struggle with those too, but yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, going back many years, I stumbled onto the discovery that we all have these, what I call, parts inside, which are full-range personalities. And not only are they there, but they all have valuable qualities and resources. And life has a way of forcing them out of their naturally valuable states into roles that can be destructive and tend to make them polarize with each other and, and lock some of them up. And, uh, and the, in addition to these parts, as I was exploring, I stumbled onto the awareness that there's another place in us, I call the self with a capital S, mm -hmm. that is our essence and can't be damaged and has all the qualities of a, a good nurturing leader and can be accessed much more quickly than people would believe because it, it's just beneath the surface of these parts. So as I work with somebody and have them get to focus on a part and, and uh, get a little bit of separation from it and then have other parts separate immediately, this self will pop out and begin to lead the work and knows how to heal these parts. So, um, so that it's pretty simple that much. Is parts we're all multiple personalities in the sense that we all have these. And it's a good thing to be that because they're all valuable, but they get uh, hurt 
and then they get frozen in roles they don't like, and actually kind of frozen in time, too, so that they don't know that you've grown up. They're often still thinking you're quite young. Mm -hmm. and they live back in, in dreadful places, so it seems like the world is very scary to them. And, uh, and like I said, some of them get locked up because they get hurt. Usually the parts that are young, very sensitive, childlike parts of us are the ones that are hurt most by traumas and rejections and humiliations. And so once they're hurt, uh, they carry what I call the burdens from those experiences, which are extreme beliefs and emotions, that drive them in extreme ways. So once they're hurt, they're no longer so much fun to be around. Mm -hmm. Before they were hurt, they were delightful, creative, playful, spontaneous, loving, little childlike parts. After they're hurt, they're, uh, they're hurting, and they're, or they're terrified, or they feel terribly ashamed. And so we don't want anything to do with them, and we, we lock them away. Right. And then we have other parts whose job it is to keep them locked up and to control the world so that we don't get triggered, they don't get triggered. So, uh, so we have protective parts, and we have exiles, which again, only refer to the roles they've been forced into. It's not anything to do with their essence. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's... Uh, about as good as I can do. <laughs> no, it's great. Yeah, it's very informative. I feel like people will really learn something from that. Um, something I really did want to talk about about my film personally is um, I've struggled with anxiety for a lot of years, and I also grew up in an alcoholic home. So those are kind of two things that I've always kind of struggled to deal with, and um, I found that. The, uh, the IFS was like one of the only ways to kind of um, tap into those like younger parts and it's actually kind of funny even this morning I was finding myself upset about something that had happened and and I journaled and found a 12 year old <laughs> and I feel like I'm just kind of always seeing all these different parts of me that are coming out and I was just curious because I read um, I read the IFS the first book that you wrote um, the manual, and it was talking about, you know, the alcoholic um, anonymous or the ACOA, like healing the inner child or how they have different parts, um, like different parts that the kids play in alcoholic families, like the different roles that we take on. And um, I was just curious if you've worked with a lot of people that were either alcoholics or ACOAs um, and how this modality helps them. Yeah, well, uh so I have worked with a lot of those clients, and uh, most of them in their families had to play one of those roles. And then their internal system is set up along those lines. So if you uh, had to be a kind of caretaker of your parents, for example, mm -hmm. then you'll have this big caretaking part that overrides all the other parts. And then, then in addition to the parts that were hurt by you, parents alcoholism will get exiled you'll have parts that want you to to have more of a life and don't want to have to be taking care of them that get exiled too mm -hmm. and so anyway um, you know as we explore we find the key parts that dominate you because of that experience and also the parts that get locked away and from this place of self you'll kind of have a wisdom about how to relate to everything so that they all come back together and they they come back in a harmonious way. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, that's interesting what you said about um, how they kind of take on the roles of sort of, the managers anyway seem to take on the roles of the parents that may have been too hard on you or made you feel that you needed to kind of take the parentified role because I've definitely experienced that in my own experience. They tend to be very like harsh critics, if that makes sense. And like, I've noticed that my managers always seem to, and the manager in the film seems to kind of just want to shut everything down and make everything perfect and make everything, you know, organized and neat. And that's the way that you get rid of, you know, the, the exiled parts or the firefighter parts. 
Um, oh, that was another question I, I wondered as well, because as I was working on the film, I, I originally thought that the character, the younger character, was an exile, and then I kind of realized that she might be a firefighter and an exile, because um, she's exiled, but her behavior and the way she acts out and stuff is kind of s similar to, you know, the firefighter role. So I was yeah. wondering, um, is that quite common, that people... Yeah, sort of, yeah. So, so people who, I mean, coming out of a family like yours, mm -hmm. it's likely you will have a firefighter that mm -hmm. can be extreme and might even look to drink, but yeah. then there are other parts that are really afraid of that fire and don't right. like it. And so it becomes a, a protector in exile, a firefighter in exile, okay. which is different than what we traditionally call exiles, which are much more vulnerable parts. Right. So, but uh, people, for example, a lot of people who use 12-step and succeed, um, it's, it's because their managers have successfully locked up their firefighters. Right. And they become dry drunks in a way because they're, you know, they're addicted to the meetings to, to hold up the managerial support to yeah. try and keep the firefighter in bank. That, my father, that really reminds me, of, the dry drunk thing was something we came across after my father sobered up, and uh, it was very, like, the idea of um, being addicted to the meetings and stuff, that, that's very, it's very interesting, because that really reminds me of what we went through about um, how my dad got sober, but then got addicted to meetings and religion and other things that kind of became, like, similar addictions, and funnily enough, I think... Um, um, I think that I have a similar kind of dry drunk, but a dry, well, not anymore, but a dry anxiety related person. So I kind of, you know, had a time where I was being more of a firefighter and kind of not knowing what to do with my alcoholic upbringing and acting out. And then I got to the point where I got a certain age and like kind of denied everything and tried to be almost like, you know, that good girl again that I guess I had come from that persona, then push that persona away, and then put it back on. Um, it's actually really funny, because I just read an article today about how, um, it was about actually Miley Cyrus, oddly enough, but it was about um, the idea that there's not that many roles for women to play when they're moving into adulthood, so we kind of try to go back to, like, you know, um, the good wife or the good woman or something like that, and have you had an experience with anything like that, like the idea of acting out and then feeling guilty about acting out and then kind of you know, being more of the good girl that you tried to get away from. Yeah, so that's the polarizations. Yeah. You've, you've got uh, an exile, mm -hmm. a vulnerable exile, mm -hmm. maybe carries a lot of shame, for example, or right. worthlessness. And then you've got a firefighter who's trying to deal with that worthlessness the best they can by getting you higher than the flames of pain. Mm -hmm. And then you've got a manager who's attacking the firefighter who, who's just doing his job, but is also this manager is scared you're going to become like your parents or is um, you know, afraid of what you're going to do to your friends or other people or your life or your body. Mm -hmm. And so it carries all this anxiety about the firefighter. Right. And at some point it succeeds in throwing a coup and and locking up the firefighter, right. but it's, it's in this constant anxiety about when it might get triggered. And the shaming that it does actually backfires because that shame goes right to the heart of the exile. Right. Yeah. It's feeling a bit worse about itself. Um, and then there's more need for the firefighter. Right. The yeah. more shame you carry, the exile carries, the more the firefighter has has to deal with it. Right. So you've been in that vicious cycle between those three parts. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, which I think is why I was sort of driven to make a film like this because I kind of realized that I got to a certain age and I kind of felt like I was more mature and I got married and I have an apartment and all those kind of like checkbox things that make you seem like a real adult. But I noticed that I was still feeling like I was still that, like, scared, you know, 20-year-old or 
now that I'm even thinking about it more and gone more depth, I was still that scared little girl who, you know, had an alcoholic father or all these different things. And I realized I was still hiding. And, um, and I also think as a woman, I realized that like, you know, it doesn't have to be like, you don't have to be a good woman just to be like, you know, a better person or something like that, like that you can find a middle ground. So I think what's interesting is I think the film was trying to find the self in a way, like, because I think I've been either a firefighter or a manager for so long that the self kind of didn't really play into it. Like it was never really there. So, um, and I don't know if I've figured it out yet, but <laughs> I'm still kind of working on it. But I feel like it's, it's interesting how you can think that the manager might be the solution, but really it's just another defense mechanism. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And, uh, also, both those parts will remain quite extreme mm -hmm. until you heal the exiles that drive it all. Right. Yeah. Those little, girl, little girls who was raised in an alcoholic family. Yeah. So, uh, um, you know, they'll either they'll kind of go back and forth, which, whichever one takes over, but they'll, they'll stay polarized. Yeah, that's really interesting because I think I've always sort of thought that the 20 year old self was the was the exile but she might more be a, a firefighter and a firefighter Ex or an exiled firefighter in a way yeah but she said that way yeah but really the root she, she's reacting to some younger part in there. yeah so no there's still more work to be done <laughs> um and another thing I wanted to ask you about was um just in general, like, I, I had this question that I came up with as I was reading um, your book, and it was kind of about um, just, like, how does IFS treat anxiety in general? Because part of me feels like after going through this process that, like, it can be um, sort of like a, like, your, cell, your uh, parts are kind of incong incongruous, and that's what kind of breeds anxiety in you. Is that how IFS looks at anxiety, or you know how they, how like how you deal with it in that in that modality? Well, anxiety can be coming from a different sources inside. Mm -hmm. So there is, uh, like you've been describing, managers who can be very very anxious. Mm -hmm. Sometimes because there's a lot they're trying to sit on and contain, and and, and they uh, they're younger, you know they're they're usually not equipped to handle a person, but they think they have to run your whole personality. Right. They have to deal with the outside life. So they're just in over their heads. Mm -hmm. Like a, a parentified child, do you know what I mean by yeah. that? Yeah, yeah, I've read about that before. So do you want to say what that is just for anyone that's listening, though? Yeah, so in families, like alcoholic families, but other families, where the parents abdicate and they're not really leading, mm -hmm. the children have to take over the family. And Mm -hmm. Taking all this responsibility, they're too young to handle. Mm -hmm. And so you may have then parts who do the same thing that are running your life and often quite effectively, but they're, they're just in this constant state of anxiety because they're in over their head. Right. Yeah. And so that's one source of anxiety, but there's several others. Sometimes it's just a very, very scared exile who, who's leaking out. Mm -hmm. kind of panic attacks and things like that right. and so on so, so you don't know in advance where the anxiety is coming from until you get inside and ask around right but it is usually in your model sort of something to do with one of the parts that's uneasy about something or yeah, um, yeah sometimes yeah. like a lot of OCD mm -hmm. anxiety is a distraction it's it's uh a way to give your mind something to focus on so you don't feel other things. Right. So that's another, you know, source of anxiety. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, because sometimes I feel like we treat anxiety almost like as an abstraction sometimes when we talk about it in therapy and as like, a, you know, something outside of yourself. And that's something I really liked about this model is it kind of gives you the tools to kind of explore sometimes and see what's going on within you that's causing it. So it seems a little bit more solutions focused in my mind. Like just does that make sense? Or? It's very practical. Mm -hmm. Because uh, 
not only in the session do you get to know these parts and change your relationship with them, but most clients do a lot of active work between sessions with their parts. So if they do start to feel anxious, they can very actively go to the scared part and calm it down mm -hmm. in a very concrete way. Mm -hmm. So it's, very, it's empowering that way. People feel like they're healing themselves. Right, yeah. Which, yeah, again, like gives, yeah. You, gives you sort of the ability yeah, to empower yourself and to, and to be that leader that you talked about, right? Like I think sometimes it's important to feel like you can be the leader of your own self, right? It's, it can be, it can feel very stressful when you think all those parts of you are you as opposed to um, just parts that you can talk to and, and figure out and understand, right? Um, I was just wondering if you ever come across anyone else who has used your theory uh, in an art piece at all, or if you've, you know, seen it in films or movies. I'm really interested in art as a tool to inform, which is why I chose to, to talk about this. So I just wanted to yeah. come across it. Um, there have been a few things. You know, the film that I, I love, that is so accurate, is Inside Out. I don't know if you've seen it. But I did, yeah. I was very it's into really, that. <laughs> it's really helped, because I can, you know, if somebody doesn't know what I'm talking about, I'll say, well, you know the film Inside Out. And they say, oh, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, there are a variety of films like that that I can refer to. And uh, in terms of somebody using IFS per se, uh, we're actually starting to collaborate with Pixar on some stuff. Really? Wow. Um, and, uh, and there's a woman who's doing a documentary on IFS now. So do you find that... That's, um, like, for example, when I watched Inside Out, even though I'm a grown woman, I just thought, you know, like, oh, how important is this for, like, not only just people like me and parents to watch this, but obviously little kids who are sort of growing up and learning how to, you know, understand these mixed emotions and these mixed feelings. So, um, so I guess, yeah, it, I, you would agree that it's sort of important to illustrate these things in different mediums so people can see it and kind of get a grasp around it because it can be sort of, you know, a little highbrow or hard to understand for, for yeah, everyone, it's right? it's very abstract until people can see it or experience it themselves. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. art has a way of, of um, taking you inside to experience it directly. Yeah, definitely. The one thing I did want to ask you just before we go is um, uh, just, you know, um, we live in obviously different areas of the world. I'm in Toronto and you're in, is it Boston right now? Yeah. So if somebody happens to see this that, you know, lives in the Toronto area or, or somewhere else and they want to access IFS, what's the best way that they can, they can get to it? Yeah, our website is selfleadership.org. Mm -hmm. That's got most of all the information on it. Okay, perfect. So they can read there and then hopefully look for someone in their area if they wanted a therapist that... The yeah, we have, we have a directory of therapists. There's a number in the Toronto area. Perfect, yeah. Um, there's a guy named uh, Derek. Um, I don't know why I'm blocking on his last name, but he's really good. Yeah, okay. Um, I can always, trying. I'll look him up and I can put him in the notes of the video yeah. so people can find him. <laughs> um, yeah, well, thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to, uh, to talk to me. I, I really appreciate it. You're kind of like a a celebrity therapist in my mind <laughs> so it was really cool to meet you over Skype. Well, you too Stephanie, yeah. I'm honored that you're, you're using IFS for your art. Thank you, thank you so much, thank you for coming up with this, it's really helped my life and my art in a lot of amazing ways so I appreciate it. You're very welcome. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.